Just how much of this so-called creative endeavor is creative is unclear, as there are many definitions of creativity currently circulating in China. Overall, creativity is a contested, discursive field in China. The true believers contend with the traditionalists, while latter see Chinese culture as the lodestone. When the topic turns to the idea of the creative industries, the stakes are even higher. The creative industries are a development idea that was introduced in the, into China and the UK in 2004, into China from the UK in 2004. It has led to a proliferation of fast policy in the name of progress and catch up. True believers see the embrace of the creative economy as in, uh, another idea reported from the UK, the creative economy, as evidence that China is coming of age, reclaiming its lost legacy, internationalizing, reaching out. Others describe the developments in creativity in different ways, using such terms as cloning, spray on creativity, cut and paste creativity, and superficial cosmetic styling. Because of the attractiveness of the discourse of creativity, however, mainly in big cities, there is a standoff between mainstream policy officials represented centrally by the Ministry of Culture and what McGee and et al. call growth coalitions. Growth coalitions are coalitions of government officials, entrepreneurs, developers, academics, and local residents. So what we're seeing, we're seeing the creative industry's idea dispersed into local communities. Now, leaving aside the problematic question of whether creativity can be industry, and that's another topic of discussion, I think the key question is, what does the discourse of creativity offer China at the end of the first decade? of the 21st century, a time when its economy is encountering its first real side effects from over reliance on manufacturing, low-cost manufacturing in particular. In fact, the economic crisis has been a call to arms for China. Part of the change prescription that's now being advocated reflects what the talk of the creative economy and creative industries is said to be about. Evaluating wealth creation through intangible assets, what the Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman calls increasing returns. Now, to explain how this uh, discursive turnaround has come about, I want to first address the idea of how creativity has been constrained in China. In the late 1980s, the, the cognitive psychologist Howard Gardner spent a short time in China on an educational reform project, and he came up with a fairly negative assessment. Gardner noted that social emphasis on correct performance, but a practice he linked directly to Confucian ritual, he, helped, he observed that education was about careful, continual shaping. That is, schooling normalizes and eradicates bad habits. This in turn leads to, lead to a harmonious society, a term coincidentally that is now the uh, uh, Hu Jintao's prescription for Chinese progress, harmonious society, but back in 1989, uh, Gardner recognized this. Gardner also recognized that the acquisition of basic skills is fundamental in China, preceding all attempts to encourage creativity. Furthermore, he noticed that art was meant to be representational and beautiful to a positive effect rather than challenging the status quo. Gardner was reminded by his host that control is regarded as a good thing in society and that the best guidance is obtained from upwards on superiors and backwards from the patterns of the past. Guidance seldom came from outside the frame, outside the box, such as from other cultures or indeed today from the internet or the Wikipedia. Now, Gardner's account is a negative view. It emphasizes control, and doing so, it privileges Western openness. It was written in 1989, but does it still hold true? Moreover, does it apply that there is not a creative future, that it's all about being shaped and performativity? Let's return to Margaret Bowden's elegant definition. I believe the answer depends on how we define creativity. That is, whether we put the emphasis on new, surprising, or useful. A key to understanding creativity in China is the use of resources in an efficient way. Rather than making something new or surprising, the foundation of the Western Romantic tradition, Chinese creativity, at least in the past, has been about rearrangement according to circumstances, which may be political, social, or economic. Now, such rearrangement, while always new in a certain sense, proceeds in patterns that are essentially recombinant. It's not so much newness that is sought out, but rather creativity that is appropriate to the context. It is held that Master, Con Master Confucius Hunzi said that culture is not established through conscious acts of creation, but through an imitation of the patterns of the past. In effect, the superior man, and that was the superior man, the sage, subdued the self in order to control, organize, and work on that which he was born, his raw substance. From this historical perspective, 
Gardner's observation of our schooling practice in the 1980s holds true. Look to the past, the patterns, and look above, respect the social order. Now, this might not have been. Things may have been different. And in my paper, I talk about some uh, historical terms back in the Warring States period, which, which may, if things had gone a different way, China may have been a less conformist society, but it didn't happen. There is a view that innovation was lost, as, just as the first emperor, uh, Qin Shi Huangdi, created the empire known as China. Or did innovation become strategic and submerged? Point that Chris was talking about, I guess. Randall Collins argues that due to Chinese intellectuals need to work within authoritarian regimes, a more complex pattern of creative interpretation prevailed. Now, for example, advisors to emperors would, they would stress the legitimacy of the past, but they would disguise it by reading them into ancient texts, but even interpreting the text in new ways. The idea that a lexicon of creativity exists in ancient times is the subject of a recent article on the early use of the Chinese term for creativity. Chuang Yi. Now, the term Chuang Yi is the term used when we're talking about the creative industries, Chuang Yi Chan Ye. According to Zhao Hong, many proponents of creativity in China believe that the Chinese word Chuang Yi is a borrowed term. The word is composed of two characters. According to the New Age Chinese English Dictionary, the first character Chuang means literally to do something for the first time, while Yi refers to meaning. Put together, they can be translated as to create a new concept of meaning. When, you, when one consults Chinese English dictionaries before, before 2007, or actually most standard dictionaries, you don't find this word. You don't find the fashionable word of creativity. You find a word, transali, transali, meaning the power of being creative. In this conventional usage, the character za refers to the act of making. So the idea is making for the first time. Now, again, if you look back at Confucian times, the act of creation was expected as making. The character in the Confucian text was invariably Zor, literally to make, or to cultivate, in other senses it meant, meant to give rise to. So the contemporary term Tuang Yi was first introduced in the Han and Tang dynasty in an academic sense to refer to the development of innovations in the form of language, Tuang Yi Zhao So it was used in a, in a very uh, academic register talk, to talk about language development. It wasn't talked about the expression of culture. It was only later by the Song dynasty, uh, and this was a period when, when, when Chinese cultural markets emerged, that the idea of Chuang Yi, creativity, began to be used in a more popular sense. By the 19th century, it was evident that the patterns of bureaucratic learning were constraining Chinese progress. The West was moving in. From this perspective, Lydia Liu's concept of a super sign provides a way to understand the ambigu ambiguity of creativity. Uh, she wrote a very interesting book, uh, and she talks about the idea of a super sign. Now, I won't go into this in detail, but she, she basically talks about the use of some words like barbarian. Barbarian was used, either way, E was used to barbarian, talk about the, the invader, the people from outside. But it was a very, uh, had a lot of meanings to it, the same as when you go to China and they say white water and or la wai. Sometimes people who are, who are non-Chinese say, my God, that's, that's an insulting term. But it has a lot of connotations to it. The same with the word with creativity. Leo asked if we can recapture the true identity of language when such problematic terms are embedded in new territories. She says the super sign is not a word, but a heterocultural signi signifying chain that cr crisscrosses the semantic fields of two or more languages simultaneously and makes an impact on the meaning of recognizable verbal units. Basically, she's just saying this very heterodox. So the term creativity, I believe, is, a, is a, what we call a super sign. It operates across linguistic and cultural barriers and across disciplinary barriers. <coughs> 